Thank you, Leslie. And we'll talk about this offline as well. Welcome to my talk. As mentioned, uh, today is all about collaboration required, threat intelligence sharing, and co-op board games. It'll be a half-half presentation, starting with CTI and then moving into the love of my life, tabletop gaming. Quick introduction to myself. My name is Grace. I am the co-founder and the COO of Pulse Dive. Pulse Dive is a cyber threat intelligence startup. We're based in New Jersey, and everything we do is focused on frictionless uh, solutions for growing teams, whether it's a single person getting free news or a more mature organization. That's everything I care about building that business. On my side hustles and my hobbies, my work-life balance, as is so important to this audience, I play tabletop board games. I am monitoring chat. I will ask some questions. Um, I see some people are really excited. I'm really glad to have you here. If you know which character this second bubble in the screen is, this guy, this ocean man here, um, let me know. I'll be really impressed. I'll even send you stickers if you can call it. And then additionally, I almost submitted a talk about how I love creating art and almost submitted a live stream drawing, but I figured that might have too many technical issues. I love creating fine art, physical art, uh, particularly watercolor and ink. And this is a drawing that I had made for the end of the year. So today, whether it's CTI or surviving invader ravages, cooperation is not an option. So between aliens and APTs, virulent strains from pandemics, uh, all of these are threats and more that we're gonna talk about. And the goal today is to get you to leave prepared and hyped to gather peers and stave off these attacks, both in the cyberspace and on the tabletop. If anyone in the chat or in the audience is in threat intelligence or uses threat intelligence in your day-to-day -day job, drop a note, would love to hear what kind of work you're doing. And if anyone has any favorite board games, drop in as well. So let's get started. Collaborating in CTI. Well, what does that mean? Why do we care? Let's level set with the baseline. What is cyber threat intelligence? It's a growing field. It's grown predominantly in the last uh, decade as its own kind of space and security. And it has a lot of definitions. We're just going to go with Gartner. Um, every vendor will have a slightly different twist. For example, they say CTI is evidence-based knowledge, including context, mechanisms, indicators, implications, and action-oriented advice about an existing or emerging menace or hazard to assets. This intel can be used to inform decisions regarding the subject's response to that menace or hazard. That's a lot, a lot of words, but at the end of the day, it's having data that's contextualized that then informs action. And of course, cyber threat intelligence, anything in the cyberspace. Nowadays, any sort of threat intelligence is somewhat tied to cybersecurity and network security. I see somebody in the chat already guessed it's from Spirit Island, and I'm extremely impressed. So we'll get into that later. Also really important here, there's a lot of talks about what CTI is, but there's a lot about what CTI is not. If you're like, oh, CTI seems so cool, and it is. Oh, the people are so cool, and they really are. Um, don't get it confused or conflated, though, with some of the conversation you might see in the space. CTI is not having a notebook with every threat group or APT. Um, it's not just having all the expensive feeds and tools out there. They can help, but that's not it. It's not having somebody on your team that has a CTI title or having a provider you're paying to do CTI as a service. It's not ingesting every indicator that you can find. It's not OSINTing all the things. And once again, it helps. And Supriya in the other track, you know, feel free to check hers out too. Um, it helps, but once again, that's not everything else. And most importantly, it's not set it and forget it. Some companies or organizations are like, CTI, that's good. Let's buy some tools, let's turn it on, and then we're good, we're never gonna touch it again. CTI is really a discipline, it is a program that requires continuous involvement, curation, and improvement to really operationalize and deliver value over time. And teams today, uh, it, it spans just like much of the security landscape. On one end, there are CTI teams on a budget, single person, IT maybe, uh, single security person running everything, trying to figure out what they can do for free, what their threat landscape looks like, how to build requirements and um, priorities. And then on the other side, mature fusion centers. Uh, a lot of them are typically like in the financial space where they've cared a lot and built and invested a ton. They have the tools, the processes, the technologies, the standards, the relationships, and they look a lot more like an iron chef, master chef type kitchen. 
and it's never solved, but they've, they've got their stuff together. But in the vast middle space, uh, it looks kind of like, uh, yeah, this is the picture of my kitchen. Just kidding. But it's a mess because people start projects, they have internal data tracking, they maybe start an open source tip, um, they're starting to collect feeds, but it's really messy. And without the right structure, it can get a little bit of a hoarder's nightmare. And you have little bits and pieces not quite coming together. It's hard to find data. It's hard to make use of data. And so there's a ton of kind of details and different types of topics that are all around the world of CTI, but most people are still just trying to figure it out. So sharing, today is all about sharing and collaboration. Why does it matter and how does it matter within the CTI space? SANS had a survey where they're tracking, straight up, does your organization produce or consume CTI? And over five years of asking the same question, the amount of respondents who went from yes, went from 60, so a little over half, to 85, almost everybody. And then that remainder that said, eh, not yet, or no, I'm not even interested, no plans at all, it's not, not for us, that 15%, that went down, down to 15%, but everyone was at least planning to or already doing this. And that's great, super, super useful. That's how you are able to get the most value. However, at the end of the day, how does this take place? I, I did a poll just earlier this month within my audience, so not scientific, about where do you currently get your best CTI content? And you know, I leave best in content to be extraordinarily vague, but I was even I was surprised. Manual and ad hoc sharing was the top. So manual, the not automated, the not you know tool driven sharing between people was number one, followed by commercial feeds and platforms. I expected that to maybe be tied or a little bit above because of how much investment and time and how much of an industry there is around you know commercialized CTI and then followed by automated sharing and other, including internal telemetry and some other methods. But what this told me, and this is why I did the research, was because as much as security as a space loves talking about tools, lots of startups, really talented people. Heck, I come from a vendor, so I think there's a ton of value and a lot of problem solving to be done is we kind of ignore when things are not quite as sexy, uh, when we're doing things in a really tedious, inefficient, non-technical way. But in CTI, so much of that is giving us real actionable results, but we don't really look at it and nobody really talks about it until you're already deep in the space. And so something that I heard I was, as I was getting into the space was, you know, years ago, it was like, oh, you know, we really need to be better at cross industry, cross sector collaboration. Uh, we need better ways to share intelligence safely and more openly. And we'll never get to the level of maturity and awareness if we're running around with our hands tied behind our back, or if um, people aren't letting us share things and our heads are cut off because CTI is drinking from a fire hose. And so what I was hearing over and over again is that this kind of networking for work, right, not, not networking for a job or networking to get hired or get a bonus, it's still really an untapped area. People talk about it, but no one really acknowledges it. It's not measured. Um, and so I went out to ask a group of professionals, you know, how, how are you doing this? Where are you going? Why do you participate? What do you get out of it? And like, how does your employer like play a role in this? And for the most part, spoiler alert, the last part, there's not really a, an organization playing a role. Some bosses are really good about it, but there's nothing standardized. So I did this free survey. Thank everybody who, you know, the 150 so respondents who went through this 20 to 30 minute survey, and I'm sharing some of the results now. So why, why is sharing important? Why do you get involved in CTI collaboration? It's all about getting access, right? To things that you wouldn't be able to see just on the public web and then being able to take action on it. Very, very hot buzzword for security, being actionable, being concrete. And so people, when they responded, they wanted to get valuable threat data. They wanted to stay aware of what's happening strategically on a breaking basis. They wanted to be able to take proactive measures and find, vet, and understand new sources and methods. And so while there's all of these conversations around like technical standards, like sticks taxi or uh, legal sharing requirements, frameworks, or public private sharing, at the end of the day, all of this is in support of being able to get access and take action. However, some of those challenges that we get, the top of 
them were no time, welcome to security. You're gonna have to learn to prioritize and make time for yourself, make time for things that are impactful. Noisiness, there's a lot of junky data out there. There's a lot of just news that may or may not matter for your organization that you kind of have to parse through. And then two challenges that are externally enforced. One is legal liability. So your organization, what they permit you to share, confidentiality clauses as well as like TLP traffic light protocol sharing restrictions. You're in this group, it's TLP Amber, you cannot share it outside the group. It's TLP Red in your organization. You cannot let anyone who's not privy or does not need to know um, have access to that information, at least for the time being. And so this kind of hampers the ability to share in this organic way, but these are very real challenges that practitioners are facing today. Now where, when people get involved in CTI, um, you know, there's a couple that are really popular, and I'm glad to say that the research I've done found that absolutely the most popular, most effective networks, uh, very much so, are the free peer to peer type of channels that are based on personal re uh, reputation and contribution. And so, kind of the first off, the strongest rated highly across almost everything was peer to peer trust groups. Somebody in chat said, you know, this resonates for me. I get some of my best information from private slacks and discords. So, trust groups are anywhere that people are vetted, vouch for each other, all contribute together in a discord channel, a slack channel, telegram channel, you know, wherever. And a lot of times those you don't know about until you're already deep into the space and you can't just ask to be added. Somebody has to want to vouch for you. You have to be able to provide value back. And a few of them like curated intelligence have a public facing front where they try to provide resources for the community, but there's a lot of work you don't see in the private discord. Second was one-to-one -one direct messages. Funny, you know, you think, oh, one-to-one -one, that's so inefficient. And in a way it is, but at the end of the day, this is what people still do. There's still a lot of value. So don't just uh, overlook it because, oh, that doesn't seem like it's like, I can, I can automate this somehow. And third is social media, public, open, um, but it's a little bit of a interesting contender in this race where when you ask about the perception of quality, is it unique? Not really. Is it high confidence? Definitely not. But can it be really timely and can it be valuable? People did say so. Did it help detect an attack? Did it help during remediation, actual results? Yeah, people said it did. So I think the lesson here about when you're on social media, so that's Twitter, Reddit, Mastodon, LinkedIn, you have to learn how to tune and really filter what you see so it doesn't become noisy and really look at like the researchers or the vendors that are providing the content that matters for you. And then one of the other pieces of research that I had was looking at who, who, what do people care about? Who, who is involved in these groups and what, what are they looking for? And so I asked everything down the pyramid of pain, something you might've heard. So are you looking for raw data, hashes, IOCs, file names? Are you looking for contextualized information that's somewhat enriched that might be correlated across data sets, trends? Um, are you looking for processed intelligence? Are you, are you really valuing advice and opinions, technical support or emotional support? And some people laughed, oh, why would you put emotional support in these trust groups? But when I asked like what people get out of it, that was one of those, not feeling alone, having a support system, having someone who's thinking about you, um, it just isn't the number one. And so when I asked uh, CTI practitioners and overall, most people wanted contextualized information. And the more senior the respondents were, the more they cared about contextualized information. Um, followed up is process intelligence. So that includes motivation strategies, like a lot of stuff that can speak to, to leadership. Um, and then raw data, followed by advice and opinions, technical support, and emotional support. However, if you're in a group uh, or you're an incident responder, these priorities will change. So IR, interestingly enough, you know, raw data, they need to know what to look for right now, what they can send to uh, clients or, you know, um, their teams right now. And raw data is the most valuable to them. That's what they're looking for. Contextualized information requires more, a bit more work. So they actually drop that to second to last. However, you look at security operations respondents and that flips all over again and goes the other way where contextualized information is the most important when they're, you know, assessing tickets or, um, working in their day-to-day -day job, while raw data is absolute dead last. It was a very clear last. 
they don't want the noise. They don't want the false positives. They just having a, a hash, for example, or an IP address gives them more work. So that is the least valuable. And then of course, with executive leadership, everyone could have guessed this. They want processed intelligence followed by contextualized information. They don't really care about technical support or raw data. And so really thinking about who you are, where you're looking and what role you have, it really depends on what kind of value you can provide back. And there are more breakdowns in the research I'd done about not just primary function, but the years of CTI specific experience, as well as the size of organization and how these priorities had changed. But you know, this is for an intro audience, um, not really digging in too deep to the specifics, but one of the things I really wanted to remind everyone was that the statement CTI networking is important for team members of all levels was the by and away the statement that had the most consensus in the response. 91% of people either agreed or very much like strongly agreed with the statement. And when you increased by numbers of total years of work experience or with five plus years of CTI related experience, that number went up to 93. And so one of the takeaways, if you're thinking about CTI, if you're in CTI and you really wanna amp up how you're networking and sharing information, I have a couple pieces of advice. One is you wanna be active. You can start small, start with people you trust, start with people in your organization, go to, go to some events, start, following researchers who are doing um, producing content related to things you're interested in or want to get in and just hear what that dialogue sounds like. Have both like coffee chats and automated interactions as well or like set scheduled interactions. And by the way, all of this advice too, I'm pulling word for word from our respondents. I'm not just making all this up myself. I ask people smarter than me, better than me, more in the field than me to also uh, give me their thoughts when I asked what advice would you give to others? So being active, just starting where you're comfortable. Then be trustworthy. There's nothing more important than trust in the security space. And it's really hard to build. It's hard to get a vouch. It's really easy to destroy. And once you do that, it's really difficult coming back. So hold yourself to the highest professional standards. You know, Make sure you trust who you're talking to. Make sure you are trustworthy in how you behave. And also you know, building trust is you know, not just being a good person or having a good analysis, but providing value in your skill set that other people would be able to leverage. Whether that means you can speak a language or translate really well, or you can script anything, or you're great at communication and creating content that different audiences can understand. That's something you can almost barter in a sharing and networking type of relationship to give to somebody and also get skills that you might have gaps for, or areas of expertise that you might need. And finally, be strategic. Um, data on the floor is useless. If you just try to get involved in every trust group or every event, you will find yourself burning out, which I know a lot of speakers today have hit on. You don't want to do that. There are more than enough venues and methods out there. So give it a shot. But if it's not working out, if it's not giving you value in your job from, you know, pretty much the get go, don't invest more time in it. You can come back later. You also wanna make sure you're verifying everything you see, of course. Make sure you know how your organization can benefit from the networking you're doing in, on this behalf. And you also want to make sure that you're able to build relationships that will pay off over time. Um, a lot of people starting just wanna get into really, you know, I guess high-end trust groups or get content from people, but um, the best way to do that is to do it together and grow with your peers. And so uh, in the report, I also have a bunch of lists that include you know, specific and other advice, but really be active, be trustworthy, be strategic. If you're interested, if you want to take a look at the full report, it's fully ungated. Um, I have the QR code. If you dare to scan, I promise it just brings you to the blog um, as well as you, the URL under. And if you do want the slides for your further research, I'm happy to drop that in as well and share it with the conference. Okay, now cooperative board games. I'm really impressed. I saw some chats in the Slack already, 
talking about Spirit Island. So I'm glad I'm talking to people who know about this game already. Um, if you hate it, we can't be friends, but I'd like to talk about it. Um, but also, if you aren't familiar with cooperative board games, this is also for you. I have a full range today of like easy, lightweight, and family friendly, all the way up to the more intense games. So once again, if you haven't already noted some of your favorite games in the Slack, please do add them. I saw somebody had mentioned Gloomhaven, D&D. &D. Um, let me see what else there is. Uh, let's see, Pandemic, that's the original gateway game. Wingspan, that's competitive though. So um, let's look at any other uh, cooperative games. And for while we're waiting on those, what is a cooperative board game? Often when people think board games, they think competitive, like Ticket to Ride, um, I'm going to beat you, we're going to do Monopoly and ruin the entire family over this. Cooperative board games are a different type of game where players are coordinating their actions to achieve a common win condition or set of conditions. Players all win or lose the game together for the most part. Sometimes you get a trader that comes in halfway. Um, and a formula for a good co-op, it requires team interaction. There are unique insights, not just like me as Grace, but like me and my character. You have different roles and you really have to work together. And there's a lot of value in working together versus just one person to be able to contribute to that win. Um, there's also meaningful decision-making or puzzle solving. Some people are like, oh, I don't really like board games that are co-op because you don't get that satisfying like win climax when you, when you crush them, crush your competitors, crush your friends you have to look at co-op as a sort of puzzle solving you're looking at this riddle that you're coming to together you know um whether it's like escaping a room or deciphering a code um there's also a lot of really good thematic or strategic immersion in which you are totally involved in the world that this game designer has set up for you and you behave in a certain way and you can take on not quite role playing but you you are thinking and acting and behaving with this role and trying to save the world for example and it's really fun. Um, one thing I love about co-op board games is that there's a lot of scalability of challenge. You can make things easier or harder. There's a lot of modular pieces often in the more complex games that you can adjust. So if you have a group that plays together a lot, you can just make it harder, add characters, add you know um, random random chance, or you can you know bring in a new user by simplifying it, giving them easier characters, giving them more straightforward objectives. And I think a lot of this is about threats, right? This is what CTI folks think about day to day. And I think this applies to cooperative board games as well. How do we work together to figure out threats? Usually there's a lot of risk and you're managing that risk and managing resources. And there's a lot of paths to lose. Often it's not just one lose condition, not just one person who beat you, but there's many ways to lose. Um, I see some people saying Forbidden Island, Arkham Horror, Stardew Valley board game. I actually don't know that one, so I'll take a look. Um, and at the end of the day, I, you know, separate from actually board games, it is a great return on investment. I'm a personal finance nerd and you can pay even for an expensive game, $50, $100. Some people say, oh, that's a lot. You get hundreds of hours of gameplay. And if you have multiple people playing with you, you know, that's, that's pennies pennies on your investment per hour. Um, and I think about that a lot too. And it's not just, you know, finance, of course, but socially and mentally, right? You are able to do things that are active with your friends versus sometimes just consuming content or spending money, like eating, you're, you're able to work together, build relationships that way. And then also challenge your brain in a really entertaining way where, um, it's not just that you're maybe like looking at a screen for me personally, I'm tired of looking at a screen after looking at a screen all day, but I'm also not just like soaking in or like feeling like I'm being lazy. It's mentally challenging. It forces me to think and learn in different ways, but in a very enjoyable way. Betrayal on the House of the Hill. That was a betrayal on, of House on the Hill is really fun. I had that as one of my slides. Somebody in chat had mentioned this and I took it out because it was kind of harder to explain, but um, I wanted to know that that was one of the ones that I had to cut because I had too many options when I was making these slides. But that one's great because in the middle of a game, you get a traitor. So let's say you're on a red team and you love kind of undermining and solving how to um, break in or ruin your your team you might love like the bioterrorist and pandemic or the traitor and betrayal because you have your own win condition you're actually trying to win on your own so 
today we're going to go through in the next 15 or so minutes a bunch of games they're all co-op uh they range from lightweight we're going to start lightweight and then go to more complex uh more strategic and the goal here is if you're brand new, if you like words or themes, hopefully there's something here for you. So I love board games and word games, crosswords, spelling bee from New York Times. Um, and so So Clover was a game that I had found in the back shelf of my friend Mark's like basement. And it was just this tiny box and I took it out and it was a blast. What I love about So Clover is it's casual. Sure, it has rules and scoring, but you could just kind of pull it out and play while you're waiting, put it back in. And so what this game allows for is that there's two phases. One is each person picks up these cards and then you kind of randomly assemble it on your Clover. And then you have to come up with word associations that would make sense just for these two words and not anything else providing noise. And so for like shell and food, you know, you're, you're working on this on your own. It might be like oyster or muscle and queen or comforter, I don't know, bed, and you have to put a single word in. Then once you have your four, you pull them all off, you take two new cards as well, and you mix them with your cards. So this is noise, it could completely ruin your game. Um, and then you give them to your other team members. So you can play, you know, two people you can, it's really fun with three or more for some discussion. And then they have to look at your cards and look at your words and figure out where strategically you, you put these words. So for example, for like blowing and copies, um, press, birthday, that would belong in this corner. But you can get caught up with noise and you have some like different turns to, if you get it wrong, you have to pull it off and you have a couple attempts, but you lose your scoring that way. But this is just kind of really open, really casual, good for you know kids as well. And it helps creative mental linking. The next, how many people in chat have played Codenames? And I want to know, did you like it? Did you not like it? Background story for me, Codenames came out, blew up. Everyone played it during the pandemic. I really enjoyed it, but it came with a lot of issues. Codenames is a word game where you have a spy master, you're doing team v team, and you're kind of picking out codes. Decrypto is the optimized version of Codenames. I see a lot of people saying yes, and we've stopped playing. If you have familiarity and you generally like Codenames, try Decrypto. It's team v team, but it removes a lot of that dead weight of waiting around or only having one spy master. And so this is half co-op, I'll say. Um, basically, you have private words like beach, princess, domino, electricity, and the other team has words you will never see. The spy master will change, the code giver will change each round. So you'll see like four to one. And the goal is to give clues that would get some your team to guess electricity, then princess, then beach, like let's say spark peach shells that is really more obvious to your team and totally not obvious to the other team. And you think, oh yeah, like how would they be able to know? Over the rounds, as you get more words from the other team and you give out more clues yourself, it becomes clearer, these associations. And so like over time, this is one that had, I don't know, six rounds or so, you're like keeping track of all the codes and you're playing spy and you're trying to decipher their messages without giving up your own team's uh, clues. So if you're reading like fire, sun, cargo short, speedo, that might be something with beach. So if someone says like palm, you might be like, oh, they're, they're trying to get palm tree and that might be beach and you would guess one for that code. Um, and then like leather, mouse, fat, Africa, maybe that's elephant. So you don't quite know exactly what words are, but you have to be very creative to kind of evade detection from the other side while making sure your team, knowing the words, knowing what they are, won't be confused. Because you can both win by intercepting the other team twice or lose by blowing up and giving your cover and not guessing correctly twice. And so this, you know, is a little bit more difficult, age 12 plus, Four players would really recommend six to eight. That's where the discussion gets really interesting. And it's you know pretty straightforward, but you can get really thematic and like make it difficult for your own team and think on the like eighth dimension. I see some people in chat say they love Decrypto. Um, I see some people saying they love code names, but it's okay, it depends on the people. Any word game very much so can be that case, but I do think Decrypto removes a lot of the things that I found frustrating with code names, like sitting around waiting. Um, and then also having just one bomb that might ruin you. Next is exit the game. These are escape the rooms in a box. I don't love that they're single playthrough, but they're extremely creative. You have a box other than some scissors and a pen and paper. It's a great date night. Um, 
during the pandemic, I went a little bit crazy. And this is a real picture of my couch. I did buy all these and I did play through all of them. I had a couple benders with some friends um, and their playthrough, they're very much so based around the same decoder disc to unlock pages or codes, um, but they get really creative with how they're using the box and the elements in the box. So I think it's fun and it also scales from, you know, much straightforward difficulty to things that gave me goosebumps when I was solving it. And so they play for about, you know, if it's really fast, 45 minutes, but up to really two hours. And so this is great because it's single playthrough, $15 each. So kind of affordable, not on the ROI front, but it's a playthrough that you can have with the kids. You could play by yourself as well. I think two people is really a strong size for this group because there's a lot of content that you want to be able to share and look at together. The crew. It's a trick taking game. If you're not familiar trick taking, it's where you put cards down and you win tricks. What I love about the crew is that it kind of takes a spin on like hearts or other uh, normal 52 poker deck type games. And it's all without talking. Your mission commander changes each round. And it's really about social or not social numbers, deduction and logic about order of play to win together. And this is also great because it's good for kids. It's great for if you are traveling, the box is yay large, which is not true of every board game. And you can't talk and you have to be able to like take on different missions because you're uh, under sea or you're out in space. So you're not able to communicate clearly. And I love that idea. And the best part is, you know, start and stop. You, you just open uh, the book and you can pick a random mission or you can progress in difficulty. There's 50 missions playing there's random chance too so it's not that each time you play a mission it is the same mission and they put modifiers to make communication even more hard or um different kind of uh modifications to different tasks and it takes as short as five minutes it can take longer but each mission is short forgotten waters this is a almost like a role-playing game where you are different members uh on a pirate ship and what I think is really great about Forgotten Waters is that it's good for family. There is an app. I don't always love an app, but the app comes and it has, it's not just, oh, it tells you what to do, but there's narrative voice acting. There's a plot. You download the stories. And this is not a game that you try to speed run. This is a game where you're hanging out with your family. You have your nephew, you have your niece, you have your, the grandpa around and you're all screaming yar and you get to play Mad Libs with your character who can be Captain Monkey Butt. And he has different stories about whether he's successful. You kind of upskilling your tree and there's dice rolling as you're gaining infamy. You're stealing treasures from each other, but of course you have to make sure your ship survives. So you come together. You, you have this really beautiful uh, book like in the middle that has different lands that you travel around. You pick up treasures and you kind of solve that objective together. And so there are different objectives each time um, and you can play different characters. You can be responsible for feeding the ship or shooting cannons. And each time you're playing, you're kind of slowly enjoying this journey together. Ghost stories. I saw someone in the chat earlier says, hey, play this game if you like to lose. Ghost Stories is definitely one of these games when you like losing to your demons. You are a monk and you are protecting your village from being haunted. Um, you can Buddha block, you can use Buddhas to block demons. It is not particularly difficult to understand, but it is hard to win. And so these are some of the demons that you fight. It says it's 60 plus minutes. In my experience, that's not true. You want older kids to play with or just adults. You can play one to four players. I think three to four is really fun. Um, the individual characters, the monks that you play do not vary all too much. So it's easy to dynamically work together. Um, and it's one of those games where you like flip the tile, you, care, you, you pick the thing and you're just like, all I see are losses. All I see are threats. The demons are coming for us. Our village will be flooded and haunted. Um, oh, somebody asked, what was the previous game? Forgotten Waters. Um, so ghost stories, so it, it, it is stressful. You have to think multiple rounds ahead, understanding potential random chance as well as like guaranteed ways to lose. Um, and this is one of those games where I pull it out with my friend, shout out to Steph, where it'll be 11 p.m. We'll pull it out and everyone in the group with us will just run away as fast as they can um, because they're just like, I don't like losing this much. XCOM. Yes, this is a video game, but there is a board game version. 
And this is the only board game where I actively love the app that comes with it. If you have played co-op games and you have thought, oh, it just takes too long. Oh no, like there's one person who's really bossy and trying to tell everyone else what to do. It is a major issue. And XCOM really does a lot to alleviate that. XCOM, the concept is that you are all very unique characters trying to protect the world from an alien invasion. Your role, you might be the squadron leader where you're going and protecting the base and fighting aliens. You might be the scientist who's researching new tech to help with your dice rolls or allow for avoiding dice rolls altogether to guarantee success. And there's a lot of fun interaction with this where you can like, the, the squad leader might kill uh, an alien body and then the, the researcher can take that body and use it for research. So it's really fun and thematic that way. And if the researcher fails at their success, if you don't roll right, then they get tired and they have to take a sabbatical for a, a round and they can't play. You can also be the communications officer that is reading from the app, which I'll get into in a bit, and making sure they're monitoring the skies and making sure everyone knows what they're doing and dropping in like protections uh, as the UFOs are descending on the continents. And then there is the commander who, just like any CISO, has no budget, is has to audit the budget, constantly is over budget and running out of security reserves, constantly panicking, has to deploy really expensive uh, jets to fight against the, uh, the alien invaders and is monitoring different crises that take place. I see somebody in chat says they have an insane loyalty, the old school games. Everything I've heard from people who've played both the video games and the board games, they're different, but they share the same vibe, which is what I love. It doesn't have to be a direct translation. Now, the reason why I love this game is because there are two parts of each round. One is timed and one is resolution. Resolution is just you're, you're resolving, you're rolling the dice, you're figuring out whether or not you're successful. The timed phase is deeply stressful. You get five seconds or 10 seconds to figure things out. There's a lot of interactivity between the roles, but there's no way for one person to play this game really by themselves effectively. And so, you know, the researcher might be finding tech that could help, but they have to make those choices and look at that research. You have to move pieces across and you have to say, hey, uh, central officer, can I use one of your satellites to move one of these guys on or off because of a new crisis? And so you have a few seconds and it's really, time bound, which is fun. And there's a lot of panic and stress. And there's this really intense music that you can play as well that immerses you in the sense of like, oh, we're fighting aliens. Oh no, the aliens are back. Oh my God, there's a, you know, a cyber disc or a, a muton elite in, in the board and they're hard to defeat. Um, so what I really enjoy is the specialization of each role and you can learn each role. It's not super difficult, but you have to play through and lose a couple times. And if you want to, there are different levels that make it in my mind, impossible to win. But once again, I like that. The more stressful, the better. After a full day being stressed in a startup, being stressed at board games is just where I am. Um, and this is a little bit more difficult and is stressful. So you can play one to four players, age, I would say 14 plus. They also say it's 60 minutes. I think it's more like 90 minutes plus one, including setup and teardown. Somebody had asked in the chat, which one is harder, XCOM or Ghost Stories? It depends. Um, I would say that in my experience, I've played XCOM more, Ghost Stories was harder to win, but easier to get started playing, and it doesn't have that time constraint. Okay, now Spirit Island, this is the love of my life. Um, I am going to try to spend the rest of my time talking about Spirit Island. This is, oh, you can't see, Ocean's Hungry Grasp. I think some people got it in the chat. This game is the love of my life. In my head, this is the best version of co-op. It is so deeply thematic. There is a really, really steep learning curve. So you do have to take some time to figure it out. Best if you find someone who can teach it to you. Um, there is an, also an app that can walk you through. It is anti Settlers of Catan. Everyone loves Settlers of Catan. I prefer Spirit Island. You are different spirits that defend the island against colonization. So like Russia, the UK, Habsburg monarchy, and blight. You're protecting your island. It takes 90 plus minutes to play really, unless you're playing a single one that could be a little bit shorter with one board. And it's you know for more complex audiences. What I love about this game is that one artwork, amazing. When you play these different characters, kind of like XCOM, you are entirely unique 
in how you think and how you can win. The mechanics are pretty modular. Uh, the way that invaders can come are pretty modular, but in one world, you might be an ocean man who's just drowning and can only be on the coast. In another, you might be trying to win through generating fear, basically spooking out the invaders. In others, you're a a plague that's ruining cities, but only likes to be in lands that are already not great and taken over. And there's so many more of these. You can be a volcano that can only build in mountains and it kind of explodes and damage impact, you know, every few rounds or so. And so the strategy just completely changes. And then not only that, there's interactions between characters and cards that you get. That means that you can play a hundred times and still learn something new and still find ways to strategize or get really whiff on a roll, but then come back from it and be really satisfying. One example, to just explain why I like Spirit Island and I'm not alone, they had a Kickstarter for an expansion that came out last, the Kickstarter started last uh, year, or it might not have been Kickstarter, what backer kit. Their goal is to raise 40K. They raised it in 15 minutes and they went on to raise $1.2 million. I was one of those people. I came in a little bit after the first 15 minutes. But this is deeply, deeply replayable. You cannot just solve a game and feel like you want it. Oh, I can never go back to this game because it's boring. You can play with younger, you know, newer people, bring them in slowly with easier spirits. Then you can play with your friends and double up on adversaries, double up on characters, make it harder, reduce your chances of winning through X, Y, Z or add boards. And if you are tired of playing the more balanced boards like this that you saw, there's thematic boards on the other side. So the game designer, uh, there's, too much blur. The game designer has really thought this through and their expansions just make it better and better and better every time, which blows my mind. So it's really deeply thematic. Um, the way you fight against France is different than the way you fight against Sweden. And it also does come in an online version. I don't love it that much. I do play it, but it, you know, it's on a phone or on Steam. And there's also a lightweight form that you can use to get started. It walks you through. It's not as satisfying to me, but it's called Horizons of Spirit Island. Okay. I'm gonna leave it on this slide. I have honorable mentions. I saw some people in the chat mention Jaws, Captain Sonar. I wanna call this one out. It's live battleship where you're trying to sink and find the other team's ships and you're screaming all at the same time and you're trying to draw lines, super fun. Um, Forbidden Desert, Forbidden Island, um, Shipwreck Arcana, Hanabi, Deception. These are all different ones. Would love to have you see more like research on your own or talk to me about it after. Um, and I'm open to any questions. Let me look at the back here. Hesitant because of app requirement. Um, I think some people were asking about if they're, uh, like for XCOM, if the app is down, the, is the game still playable? Unfortunately for XCOM, it is no longer playable. Uh, you need the app to really help guide you. There's a lot of kind of storytelling from the invader side. Um, so yeah, in that case, but it's worth, it's not that expensive. And from what I've seen after having this game for maybe six years, app still works. It's super simple. Um, I like how somebody said, this is good Intel for birthday gifts. I like that you called this Intel. This is my intelligence, my strategic intelligence about what games to give to people. Somebody asked, do you play any of these games on steam? Um, during the pandemic, a lot of my group played virtually, um, not just these, but also terraforming Mars and so forth. And um, un for me, I just, I just don't want to sit at my computer any longer. I might be able to play a phone app if I'm sitting on the couch or you know, um, with my partner. But at the end of the day, I try not to be at my desk too long unless I am working. And uh, just a real quick talk, I'll go back. Um, let me know if there's any questions from the moderator. But um, in Spirit Island, it's fun because you have tokens where you can uh, evade lateral movement, you can prevent capabilities like a that doesn't allow for building, you can make them ineffective by adding a fist to the invaders, you can even do counterattack with bears. And so these tokens are just really cute. Well, thank you so much, Grace. This is Grace. This has been absolutely fantastic. Really appreciate uh, by building my uh, wish list for the holidays next year already. This has been a lot of fun. Both of your talks were super informative. Thanks for spending some Sunday time with us. And of course, there can be more Q and A in the in the uh, Slack chat if people would like to ask more questions. Sure. Yeah, and I will stay in Slack too and answer any questions or give recommendations as see fit for the next thirty minutes or so. Awesome. Thank you.